Greetings and salutations folks and welcome once again to another helping of Mr H's Hot Pot. You join me today still in the Twixmas period, that period between Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And as promised in my Christmas Day message I've come out today and I've returned to the old Standish Mineral Line which is here in my hometown of Wigan. And originally it ran from Gidlow which is near Beach Hill in Wigan all the way through to the village of Standish, which is about three to four miles away from Gidlow. And the old mineral line used to transport coal from the local collieries, which was around this area. It served four collieries, I believe. I think Robin Hill Drift Mine, uh, Giant's Hall Colliery, Taylor Pit and uh, John Pit, I think it was, all, which was all round in this area. And as stated, I've come back today to take a little look at some more of this railway line because roughly where I'm stood now is where I ended my last video. If you'd like to take a look at that video, you can use your Columbo-like research skills and go and uh, dig through my archive and you'll find it. Or you could simply follow the link that I'm going to put up now for you. And in that video, I cover all the relics and all the, uh, the little bits that have been left behind from our industrial past on this former railway line which was the bulk of the mineral line from here on in where I'm going to walk to now there's not very much left you know building work has sort of encroached onto where the old mineral line used to be so there's only little pockets left but we're going to discover and take a look at one of those pockets today now what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the old mineral line here, which is uh, the Noah Bridle Way, it was made of Bridle Way after the line closed. But instead of following it down there, which is the path of the Bridle Way and where it likes you to go, we're going to instead continue on and follow what would be the course of the old railway line. Now, I'm a little bit upset really because I came doing a recce here about two weeks ago. And there was none of this hot pot as well, I'm going to show you. You know, it looks like the SOM here now. But apparently, they've been doing some work here. They've been putting a new cable in. Probably to one of these new houses, which you can see there. Probably somebody wants broadband in or something like that. And I was a bit annoyed because it's like the SOM here now. You know, I'm having to... I've had to get my new wellies that my father had got me for Christmas. I've got to fire them in anger. And... Uh, walk along a muddy path but rather than being annoyed about it in a deep sigh Mr H is always the glasses half full type of man and although they've been down here with a little machine and dug it up it also means that they may have unearthed some little relics of something we're going to take a look at that's just down here and hidden in these woods and what we're coming to look at today Hot Potters are the remains of an old 19th century Collierer, which is hidden in these woods just up here. Now it was known as Swire's Pit and originally, you know, it operated I think between 1850 and it closed in 1875. It didn't run for that long and the reason for that was the coal that they got out of the pit was pretty poor by all accounts and it was owned by the Wigan Coal and Iron Company and they made a bit of a a bit of a blunder really opening the pit but as luck would have it they found cannel in there which is something that's very very it's a product that's very uh, unique to the area of Wigan there's an abundance of it and that burns like it's like a bitumen stuff and it burns very bright and that saved them really so they haven't lost out too much anyway we're going to make our way up this muddy path here and see if we can find the remains of this old pit. I do know there was two shafts to this. There was number one and number two shaft. The first shaft that we should uh, come across in heading in this direction is number two shaft. I'll uh, show you a quick little uh, screenshot from a, a map from 1927 which will show you this colliery on it and it'll show you it disused. So I'll show you that now, and then we'll return and we'll see what relics we can find. Mm. 
Okay folks, welcome back. We're now following the path of the old mineral line here in this overgrown pocket of what remains from the days of the old mineral line. I estimate that roughly where that fence line is there to those new houses which were built post 1960s I would probably estimate that's where the line used to run as you can see it sort of dips down there and then it comes back up so I think that would have probably been the railway embankment at one time or another we're going to follow this path here which that machine has handily made for us albeit a bit muddy when it come putting a cable in the other week and as we make our way along here you should be able to notice there just to the left of the shot a little triangular pillar that little triangular pillar marks where number two shaft to Swire's Pit is and it's an official NCB capping what happened was in 1947 the great year of nationalisation in the UK when the NCB was formed one of their duties was to take over responsibility of not only working collieries but also disused collieries and they had the Herculean task of going around the country and capping any disused shaft to a particular standard that would deem them safe and this is one such shaft number one shaft is over there which we'll take a, a look at in a moment so I'll whip the camera around now and we'll, we'll have a little chat about how they used to cap these mine shafts back in the day now as a small child growing up in and around the town of Wigan I was always warned by my parents to keep away from concreted areas that had a concrete pillar on it like that and they're a familiar sight for me these they're slowly disappearing now as uh, land gets developed but back in the 80s there was a lot of waste ground and the, those were dotted all around them as I said in previous videos the town of Wigan is littered with old mines and mine shafts so these were a very familiar sight and my parents as I said would always warn me to keep away from them because they would say you know beneath them lies a very deep shaft and uh, you know, if you go near it and it collapses, you'll fall down it and we'll never see you again. And they give you all those kind of horror stories. Now, that story is partly true. Beneath that concrete pillar is the centre of the mine shaft that it caps. However, when you take a look at the specification and the amount of material that goes into capping a mine shaft, the thoughts of it collapsing under the weight of a small child or even a large adult after a Christmas dinner is ludicrous. Now, I always thought as a kid that when you saw the concreted area that that was the, the complete width of the shaft and that's not the case. In fact, it's only half the size of the concreted cap. And the reason for that is what they try to cover when they cap a shaft is the collapse zone. And the collapse zone is the edge of the shaft. You have your mine shaft like that and then further out is the collapse zone. And they try to cover that in case it collapses at 45 degrees and falls into the shaft. Now that's known as the angle of repose. Anyone who's worked in the building trade, you will have heard of the angle of repose, especially when it comes to digging trenches and things like that. And for those of you who've not worked in the building trade, if you can imagine getting a bucket of sand and plonking it down on the floor and then you plonk another one on top and another, eventually the sand will collapse under its own weight. It usually collapses at a 45 degree angle and that's known as the angle of repose. So the idea of covering the collapse zone when the captain mine shaft was, when it was completely covered, even if it collapsed underneath the capping, it would still be safe. And that's why the cappings were so thick, just in case the top of the shaft collapsed in on itself. Anyway, I'm going to whip the camera around now and we'll set foot on the capping and we'll take a little look at some of the details of an NCB capped mine shaft. Then we'll move on to uh, pit shaft number one of Swire's Pit and we'll be able to take a look at the depth and the thickness of the concrete because it's a little bit more exposed than this one is. Anyway, I'll whip the camera in now and uh, we'll take a look at number two shaft. Okay folks, well we're going to approach the shaft now and uh, and take a look at this capping. And as I set foot on this capping, it still feels strange, you know, being told 40 years ago, never to set foot on one of these by my parents. I'm now walking over what would be known as the collapse zone, which I explained to you earlier. And probably the edge of the shaft below us is probably about here. 
certainly that triangulated pillar there, that marks the centre of the shaft. Now that little piece of metal that's sticking out there, that would have been a monitoring well back in the day. And what they would have done, they would have monitored the shaft below us for any gas that was forming underneath. Now how they would vent that in the event that there was a build-up of gas, I don't know. Now one of the features that's missing from this triangle pillar, and it looks like it's never had one, is a plaque that would have been placed on one of the sides. Um, all that would have had on it would have been the information of the date this shaft was capped, the depth of the shaft, the pit it belonged to, and the number of the shaft. You know, if the pit had more than one shaft, which most of them did. And like I said, this appears never to have had one placed on it for some reason. Now a lot of those are missing, unless you get into some remote areas, you know, you'll find that most of them have been smashed off or pulled off down the years with vandalism. And it appears here somebody has come and done a little bit of illegal dumping on top of this mine shaft. Providing rubble to cap this shaft is probably about 60 years too late. But yeah, this is number two shaft. Now around the edges though, would have been a fence originally, although I can't find any remains to this one, so it may never have had one. But it would have been no more than either andelion that had been knocked in and concreted into the floor, and some wires placed through it, or if it was really posh, probably some concrete posts. But this one doesn't appear to have had any in, so I would say this is how it was left the date it was capped. Anyway, that was number two shaft. Let's move on to number one, shall we? Okay, folks, well, we're back on that man-made track now that that machine made when it laid that cable a few weeks ago. According to form, it looks like that cable went through that fence line there, or underneath that fence line, should I say, into that greenery area there beyond those trees. I do know that that is an underground reservoir, so whether or not... It needed some cable pouring in for whatever reason or not, I don't know. You can just see there, along the back of that fence line to those houses, there's a lot of rubble, a lot of stone and things like that. Now whether or not that is colliery related or not, I don't know. I should imagine there's probably some modern day building rubble mixed among that lot from when they built these houses and it was a building site. Anyway, we've not come to look at modern day building rubble. We've come to have a look at the remains to the old Swire's Pit, or Colliery, whatever you want to call it. And I'm now making my way through to where number one shaft used to be and where it's been capped. You can just see it there through those trees. Number two shaft is back there. you see it there in the centre of the screen. So these shafts were very close to each other. Now I do know that the design of collieries to have two shafts at one time was to allow her to circulate and also use them as an escape shaft in the event something went wrong. But back in the 1800s I don't know if that's how they, they used to design collieries or whether it was just a one shaft job so anybody who knows more about collieries than I do please feel free to leave your comments or indeed your thoughts below. Now as you can see from the edge though you can see the thickness of the concrete covering that shaft a lot better than you could on number two. And just looking at the thickness here, what's exposed above ground, it's ridiculous to think that the weight of a small child would force that to collapse, but that's what I was told as a small child. Obviously my parents, they wanted to keep me safe and away from danger, so they gave you that horror story. Anyway, without further ado, I'll... Uh, Whip the camera around now, we'll take a, a closer look at some of the features of number one shaft because it is a little bit more exposed, so we should get a good view of how they used to cap these things. Okay folks, well I'm now stood in front of what used to be number one shaft here at Swire's Pit, and I'm going to take a little look over there in a moment and measure that exposed bit of concrete there on the edge of the shaft because that will give us an idea of roughly the thickness of the slab that was used to cap this former mine shaft and I should imagine it's pretty thick below ground as well 
but we can only go off what's above ground. I'm not going to get a spade out and start digging trial holes at the side of it. You know, uh, it's not worth it. I'm not going to do that at Potter's. But I'll take a tape measure over now and I'll uh, measure the little bit that's been exposed above ground for you. And there we have it up, Potters. 13 inches, 1 foot 1, or in new money, that is 330 millimetres. So it's quite thick, the actual slab, and I should imagine it goes on below ground, probably the same distance again. So there is absolutely no way would that have collapsed had I been on it as a small child. Anyway, I'm going to work with the camera around now. We'll make our way towards the centre of uh, what used to be the shaft and we'll take a look at it and uh, we'll see if there's any different features on this one to number two shaft. And this is a closer look at that edge of the shaft that I've just measured for you. If I pan along though you can actually see where the original shuttering used to be, roughly where that bottle is there in the centre of the screen. Now looking at it, it looks like substantial concrete, you know, it's not just any old rubbish that they've mixed together and used it to cap the shaft. It will have been to a certain consistency, and it'll have had to be to a certain strength. I believe once they've been capped, these mine shafts, they have to withstand 33 kilonewtons of force being placed on top of them. So, as you can see, it's uh, certainly been built to withstand that kind of force being placed on it. That little hole there that's in the centre of the screen, that looks like it's where the original fence post would have been placed. There's one on the corner there, and it looks like there's one there in the corner that's got filled in. So why this one had fence posts on it, and number two shaft didn't, you know, that bit remains a mystery. But I'm going to make my way onto the cap in itself now. Once again, you've got the collapse zone which I'm stood in, and we'd probably be making our way to the edge of the shaft, which would be about here. Most of these old shafts from the 1800s would be no more than three metres across, apparently. But once again, we've got the triangle pillar, which marks the centre of the shaft. Yeah, again, this one has had, it appears, a, a little well so they could monitor gas. Must have been a pretty gassy area this back in the day but it hasn't had any plaque attached to it stating the depth of the shaft or any more other details. Now that could simply be because they don't know the depth of the shaft. A lot of uh, mine owners didn't keep records of things back in the day they simply didn't bother. And the reason for that being, they knew where the shaft was on their land. So it didn't matter, you shouldn't have been there. But anyway, that's uh, number one shaft. As you can see, it's in good condition. After all this time, they've still managed to maintain it. And what you've got to think is, it's really amazing to think that just so close to these shafts, was a railway line which would have been just through those trees there. You know, you would have had trains thundering past full of coal coming all the way down there past number two shaft. And it's a testament to Victorian engineering that these didn't collapse in. Now, for anybody who knows the local history of Wigan, there is a story in one of the other local villages of a train that ran over a mine shaft and it did collapse in and he ended up, the driver, Ludovic Barry, disappearing down it with his train dolly and all the coal tubs. And it was that deep they couldn't get him out. So they just uh, filled it in. But yeah, as I said, a testament to Victorian engineering that they was able to run a, a railway line just through those so close to these disused shafts. Anyway, that was the shafts. We're now going to make our way that away through the trees. And over there, that little um, area over there, just in front of you, 
where those trees are. That's where there used to be what I think was a pumping pit. Because there's a little brook that runs along here known as Burley Brook. And I think that used to be a pumping pit to get all the water out of these shafts that I'm now stood on. And uh, safely away so it didn't flood the mines. So we'll take a look over there now shall we? So we'll leave the cap shaft of number one pit behind us. And we'll make our way through this little wooded area here to where the sits the remnants of a brick structure which I think back in the day used to be a pumping pit. Now mines that were very close to the water table they would need some form of equipment to extract water out of the tunnels that were being dug below ground. And I think that is what this little brick remnants and structure used to be. Because if we make our way in, we'll be able to see where I think they used to sit a flywheel that would have been used in this uh, structure to generate and get the water out. The pipes that you can see there, I don't think those are original, those look like they've come off those fields at some point, probably at the hands of children building dens. That's assuming children still do that kind of thing. That gives you the length of that trench so it probably was a, a fur old flywheel back in the day. You know. Very hard to imagine just looking at ruins what they would have looked like. And unfortunately, there's no plans surviving online of what this looked like. You know, like a stone trough or trench here, what that would have been for. Who knows whether or not water ran along here and, you know, made its way back into the, the little brook that runs through there and just through those trees there at the centre of the screen or not. You know, it's, uh, I don't know. But those blocks, I'm stood on one of the blocks, that block there is it, one of these. It would have continued along so it would have been a substantial little structure this back in the day you just need to take a look at the thickness of those walls make our way along here and you can see that this part of the building you know it's uh, it's more hexagonal in shape as opposed to being square or rectangular like the rest of it you can see though that the brickwork is been built into a half circle for some reason and then you've got a metal bar sticking out of it. I'll stake my, my reputation as Mr H's hot pot that this at one time was a pump, a pump house of some description or a pumping pit. I have taken a look at one of the pumping pits up in another village very close to here which is Aspel. I've not documented that as yet. Many of you keep asking me, you know, when are you going to document that, Mr H? But just looking at some of the photos online of that and what little bit of it I've seen over the fence, these remains are very, very reminiscent of that. Anyway, I'm going to I'm going to take, switch the camera off for a moment and then I'm going to make my way down there with those pieces of fencing now so you can take a look at this structure from the back. As uh, It's very mossy and very slippy and I... Uh, I don't want to be going bum over pap, not so close to New Year. And this is a, a closer look at that half circular bit of brickwork from this angle. As we can see, that's a threaded bar that runs right down there. Which is pretty loose. I don't know what that goes down to, it's probably attached to something way below ground. There is 
another bar on this side but it's been flattened over now you can just see it there it'll have uh, taken some force to bend that over I should imagine just looking at it but you know, it's, it's sort of coffin shaped this this brickwork and uh, it's very it's slanted it's got uh, slanted sides built on it as you can see it's not it's not you know plumb so this has taken some water of some description I would say there's an old bit of railway line you know or a, a girder of some description and close inspection it looks like a small H girder has probably come out of this structure Anyway, I'm going to make my way around to the back side of this now and uh, we'll take a look at it from there because you can certainly see the shape of it when you get round the other side. So join me in a moment when uh, I get round the other side and I, I negotiate this little bit, of a, little bit of an embankment here. Well, I've managed to make it out of potters. A little bit more brickwork sort of at the side of the main bulk of this structure so yeah I should imagine that was a channel you know the water was drawn up there where that tree's growing out of that pit that narrow slit trench that I showed you you know it would have been pumped out of there and it probably ran down here and then back into the stream over there we'll take a, a closer look of what remains Yeah, plenty more of those pipes that have come off the fields there, the drainage pipes then. Looks like some kids have been building a den. Now in that particular pipe there, let's negotiate that tree, you can see part of a girder or a little bit of railway line. It's just been cut off, obviously they put that round so nobody walks into it. Lots of little niches built into the wall of this... Uh, this structure, you know, at first glance you would be forgiven for just thinking the bricks had fallen away, but it looks like those have purposefully been left out. Certainly the larger niches have. A little bit of a girder above it there. Again, if anybody's got any idea as to what these niches would have been, please feel free to leave your comments below. I'm always interested to compare other people's thoughts to my own. And as you can see, there's barley brook just through the trees there. So it's definitely put here, I think, to extract water. There's no other reason for it. Just negotiate my way up these remains without slipping. And we'll take a look at it from this angle. I mean, you can just see the, the sheer thickness of these walls it means this has held something substantial. Again, more little niches that have been left out and they've been left out at regular intervals so they have held something those you know it's not just been a case of they've been put in for no other reason now looking at this here that looks to me very similar to where there was a big iron bolt over there over there on that side on that little bit of archway work there so maybe that elder pole at one time who knows fascinating stuff fascinating stuff to think that this has been here since at least you know 1850 1875-ish all part of our 
industrial past here in Wigan. Right then, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to whip the camera around and I'm going to make my way through back to where I started this video and we'll be able to take a look at how this man and the mining that's been done in this area has helped to shape the landscape as we see it today as it's uh, collapsed in places and that's very interesting right then folks I'm going to whip the camera around and we'll make our way out and uh, we'll slowly wrap this video up so I'm now leaving those man workings from the old Swires pit behind me and we're making our way through a wooded area that would have run alongside the old mineral line back in the day now I think the reason this particular part hasn't been built on is because of those man workings behind me obviously the developers who built that estate they didn't want the cost involved of trying to build on this particular area but what's interesting as we make our way through these woods is the lie of the land because I'm approaching now a bit of a ravine which as I get to the edge of I'll show you, I'll whip the camera around and at first it just appears to be a natural lie of the land when you get to it and you get a, a closer look at it you realise that underneath in the old man workings it's probably collapsed and that's what's led to this ground subsiding the way it has anyway I'll whip the camera around now and you can take a look Now we'll make our way to the bottom of this because there's a bit of rubble from the old buildings that used to stand behind me as it looks like somebody has made a bit of an attempt to try and fill this in at some point but um, it's amazing how the colliery workings underneath have forced this land to have this dip in it you know and you can only imagine that they, back in the day they used pit props made of wood if indeed they used any at all now my father who used to work in the man said you know you, it was unbelievable the amount of pressure that there would be on the pit props from the ground above and eventually you know if you've got water running in those old workings and things like that and they're made of wood wood rots doesn't it so it's not surprising and this wouldn't have happened overnight this trench would have not been formed overnight it would have formed over decades here's a closer look at that brickwork and beneath me was probably an area that was extracted of either coal or cannel as I say the old pit it, uh, it sort of saved its bacon a little bit when they started extracting cannel out of it because it was a it was a pretty sought after substance apparently otherwise the Wigan Coal and Iron Company they would have probably made a blunder just investing in opening a pit here for poor coal yeah there's some more bricks there that would at one time have been attached to some buildings right then I'm going to make my way out of this wooded area and just before I close this video and wrap it up I'll show you some remnants from the old buildings because there's some interesting little pieces that have been churned up that I've managed to find on the surface with those guys back there laying that cable so join me in a moment and then we'll wrap this video up okay folks well here's a little look at some of the relics that I managed to find on the surface I've taken a look at some of the bricks but unfortunately they have no names on them probably back in the 1800s they didn't have makers names on them like they did in years afterwards so what I'm mainly going to show you now are little bits of drainage which were from that building that I showed you earlier first of all we have a little relic of a ceramic pipe appears to be about four inch bore on it that you know that was that was just there on the surface what was really interesting was this which is almost intact you know now what that would have been you know you would have had a, a metal grate inside that and it would have been a drain at one time and as I say it's almost intact other than a little bit of damage on the edge here you know you could uh, you could use that you could sell that to a salvage place the only makers initials that are on this I don't know if you can see it is CM on there 
I'm going to put that back down carefully because it would be a shame to just throw it down and smash it. Yeah, those are just some of the relics that are here on the surface in this area. Now what I might do in the new year, once summer comes round, I might return here with the metal detector. I know I always say this and I never end up doing, do I, because I'm busy with other stuff, but I think this is worth returning to and just whipping round with the old metal detector. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll stick that one in the old noggin for another time. Anyway, folks, that brings us to the end of today's video, sadly. Hope you've enjoyed this little walk around uh, the old Swire's Pit here in this little pocket of what is left of the old Standish Mineral Line. We've explored everything. If I continued past number one shaft, you just come to some houses and it's like a dead end. Now, there is another little pocket, a little area of the old mineral line that hasn't been developed yet, but that's up in Standish and that's for another day. Right then, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to edit this video up, ready for your edification as always. So until the next time, when you join me once again, it is bye-bye for now.